eye for his political work and dissident persona, and Murakami for his association with manga, anime, commercial products, and his creative production company, Kai Kai Kiki. In order to be a global artist, one must, of course, be well known internationally and have a certain stature on the contemporary art world circuit. But it was, it's not necessary to be an international superstar. The work of superstars like Ai Weiwei and Tadashi Kurma, Kur, Murakami tend to have a singular, fixed, determinant meaning. Today, I'm going to focus on three artists who are well known within art world circuits, highly regarded and influential internationally. These artists offer their audience a kind of experience quite distinct from that offered by the super famous artists like Ai Weiwei and Tadashi Murakami. Their work is multivalent and complex with a certain ambiguity that refuses a singular reading. It draws from a variety of sources and can be accessed via multiple entry points. Through New York, sorry. Um, through New York connections, these artists operate in the global art circuit, exhibiting at international biennials and major art museums throughout Europe, the US, the Middle East, Latin America, and Asia, but remain strongly connected to their home countries. I focus here on their early watershed work, new work that emerged from these spatial shifts, as well as more recent projects in each case, the influential stature of these artists has opened up new avenues for art making for others. These artists are both global artists and global citizens, engaging political, economic, or commercial spheres. They speak from the Asian experience, even while circulating in both the West and the East, even as those terms are being collapsed. <laughs> The period of modernism strived to identify a common universal language for art, using abstraction and geometric shapes to create a pictorial Esperanto, free of nationalist linguistic constraints. The concept of the international recognizes multiple national identities while maintaining distinct boundaries between these. Global art embraces the convergence, the merging, the blending, the disintegration of boundaries while secretly coveting the cultural and geographical locality of origins. In 2004, I organized a traveling exhibition of contemporary art from East Asia. And it's through my visits and travels that I became interested in the link between the past and the creation of the art of the present. That same year, I also organized a Shazia Seconda exhibition and commission, the second project in a series in which artists were invited to create work in response to historical art in the museum's collection. Shazi Sikander was born in Pakistan and studied the Indo-Persian miniature painting style under a traditional master at the National College of Arts in Lahore, and later attended the Rhode Island School of Design. She was the first to pioneer an unorthodox use of Mughal miniature painting in the 1990s, which she adapted to her personal experiences in the US. While there are, were few students at the art college studying these techniques when Sekanda was there, there is now a renewed interest in these historical practices among many contemporary practitioners. In 20, in 20, oh, 2004, Shazi and I collaborated on a project where she created 20 works in response to works from the very famous Bini collection from four Islamic kingdoms in South Central India. The visionary, poetic, and richly colored painting styles created for the Dakani courts from the 16th through the 19th centuries were a product of a wide array of cultures that visited and traded with the prosperous kingdoms that ruled there. Sekanda often gravitated to one or two elements within a work and then amplified them in her interpretation of the source. She selected works with narratives or characters that resonated with her own experiences. 
Sikandar writes, when I first left Pakistan to come to the United States, I encountered a new geographical space. Living in, these fairly neutral, in a fairly neutral space, I was interested to express in a personal voice antithetical issues concerning historical animosities between India and Pakistan, and to expose Western stereotypes about women from the third world. In this work, a male figure in the center, resembling a Mughal emperor as a young man, is in the company of two multiple armed Hindu goddesses in the form of Durga and Kali, or Kali, one flying and armed with deadly weapons while wearing a burqa, required of Afghani women in public. The winged horse bur Barak from heaven and with a woman's head in the Quran flock flies Muhammad on his mirage to heaven. Uh, <coughs> it is also uh, reproduced as small black emblems, as if a passport stamp approving our passage to the Muslim heaven. Also in the exhibition was an early animation spin. Chats Sikander explains, this work is, quote, a pun on the news media channel CNN. Spin depicts a dense mass of abstracted imagery swirling inwards, hovering like a swarm of angry black crows or bats. It eventually settles into the image of a traditional Mughal Durbar hall, incongruous, incongruously populated by gopi women. And gopi women are devotees of the Hindu god Krishna, whose abstracted <coughs> black hairdos comprise the central imagery of the work. The multi-channel parallax, a much more recent work, composed of hundreds of digitally animated images taken from Sikander's watercolor gouache and ink paintings, features atmospheric and sometimes <coughs> operatic music and sound by Du Yun, with Arabic poetry recitation. The animated movement and abstraction accentuate the, sensu the, the sensation of a journey, spatial territories and invasions of the conflictual geopolitical maritime history of the Strait of Hormuz. See if I can play it. And here's just a clip of this. asks, how much time and distance do you have to travel before the translation becomes the original? First shown in 2013 at the Sharjah Art Biennial, Parallax has since traveled to Texas, Umia, Copenhagen, Dhaka, Seoul, Bilbao, Boston, Moscow, San Antonio, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Rome. Her extended practice and dialogues on the global circuit has challenged her to push further against artistic limits, enriching her expanded practice. While Sikander's trajectory from Lahore continues as an exploration 
of an expanded orientation to Indo-Persian miniatures. Thai artist Rikrit Tirvanit has always been global. The son of a diplomat, he was born in Buenos Aires and raised in Thailand, Ethiopia, and Canada. He is the co-founder of the Land Foundation in Chiang Mai. The foundation initiated in 1998 is a plot of land which the artists make available to local farmers to do experimental rice farming. They have also invited international artists and architects to build structures on the land, providing a space for the convergence of artistic and agricultural production. In another project, the video Long Nia visits his neighbors. Time slows to a crawl. The video features a 60-year-old um, <clears throat> retired rice farmer living in a rural vi village outside of Chiang Mai. Chirvani describes it as not a documentary and not a narrative, but more of a portraiture with a radically minimalist, minimalist aesthetic. Its title character, a humble, well-liked man, though <coughs> retired is far from idle. Lung Nua goes from about his daily rituals of visiting the market, hunting, visiting a forest to pick herbs for cooking, bathing in a river, praying, chopping wood, and taking a long walk. <clears throat> Teravit is most known for his cooking works, in which he makes traditional Thai meals, especially curry and rice, which he shares with the audience. In fact, he recently started a restaurant with his dealer, Gavin Brown, in upstate New York. Taravit uh, says Taravanit, one day I was walking along West Broadway in New York on my way to visit a gallery where I was supposed to participate in a group exhibition curated by Robert Blongo. I was thinking about the situation. That is, would be this, that this would be the first time my work would be exhibited in New York. It seemed like a lot of pressure to succeed. So I decided to take the opposite attitude, which was to relax. Then and there I decided to make something that was very close to me, and that was part of my everyday experience when I made the first cooking piece. It was not about cooking at all. I suppose it was never been, has never been about cooking, but was rather a kind of museological critique about cultural fragmentation, the removal or displacement of cultural artifacts from one original context to another, i.e. from the East to the West, from my perspective. Free, a 1992 work, was open 24 hours a day, and people lived, ate, slept, partied, and had sex in the gallery. This simple, anti-commercial gesture embodied an idealistic, contemporary, bohemian lifestyle. In 2008, the Drawing Center in New York hosted an exhibition of Taravanit's um, Tar <laughs> work, comprising more than 200 works on paper, the drawings depicted contemporary scenes of protests from around the world. Commissioned by Teravali and drawn by Thai artists, many of whom are his former students, the demonstration drawings show the ongoing human desire for equality and fairness and the need to speak truth to power. The very act of their making is a parallel event. Just as the protesters march together for a common goal, a critical mass of artists is brought together for a specific purpose. To the end, in the end, the documentation of the protesters' effort is lasting evidence of their existence. In 2015, I collaborated with Chiravanit on an exhibition at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. The exhibition uncovered narratives, revealed personal stories, and shared vignettes that led to a larger understanding of the relevance of migration in the production of material culture. The artists in this group show were individuals who themselves are circulating across cultural geographies. These focused stories led to larger scenes of human interaction and engagement by redrawing boundaries of trade and labor colonialization, political affiliation, and more, all of which have, have a profound impact on vernacular, cultural, and local, and indigenous experiences. 
The Teravani uh, origins, journeys, and the stories that surround them are catalysts for bringing people into a more intimate understanding of themselves and the interdependence of cultures. And here are some, oops, here are a couple of uh, images from the exhibition. The final work I'm showing here is an 84 foot print that diagrammatically shows the geographic pathways of Tiravanit's <laughs> life. Several master printers, shop managers, and at least 40 students worked on the project at one time or another, embodying his willingness to hand over parts of the production to others. Tiravanit is famously peripatetic, and indeed the subject matter of the print specifically concerns his movements through the world and through life, this physical and temporal passage. Running in a continuous strip through the center of the work is a digital copy of the artist's passport, page after page. You can see that pink line there. Chronicling 20 years of travel and foreign residency. Around this stable, yet constantly changing central band is a dizzying array, dizzying, dizzying array of images. See plans referring to places that Teravani has chose, big abstracted mazes from archaeological and architectural sites, symbols representing various types of human experience, such as time zone lines, or arrows referencing urban flow, and representational vignettes, such as images of the ships sailed by Christopher Columbus, and a half century before him, the Chinese explorer Zheng He, little known in the West. Korakrit Aranjai was a student of Tiruvani at Columbia. Thai culture appears in his work, which focuses on youth culture and Buddhism interwoven with Western symbols such as blue jeans. He uses technology, fashion, and craft to achieve a chaotic blend of fiction and reality embodied in the avatars which are found throughout his videos and mixed media installations. The following are some of uh, the works from a, a long-term series that he's been working on called Painting with History in a Room Filled with Men with Funny Names. So this, um, this is both installation work and video work. It features a footage of modern American artists interspersed with images of Thai youth in blue jeans. So the bottom is from the very famous Hans Namath uh, uh, film of Jackson Pollock making a painting, but they use this um, piece of glass so you could actually see the movement of the paint. And so he actually found footage of other artists who were doing, who were captured doing the same thing, and he interspersed that with images of Thai, uh, Thai youth in blue jeans who are kind of part of the kind of uh, youth kind of hip culture. Um, he relates um, the rise of denim culture with the importation and appropriation of Western culture, which affected everything from fashion to modern art. With these paintings, he seeks to identify himself as a denim painter. And this is him, the artist, um, painting on his own body. And here are a couple of images. Um, he had a fantastic show at the Palais de Tokyo a couple of years ago, um, which you can kind of get a sense of how absolutely crazy and chaotic it was. Um, and this is a more recent project in Bangkok. He's now more based in Bangkok than New York. And I just want to um, end by um, reading a letter he wrote and then a very short clip. Dear everyone, it's been four years, and this is an artist that's born in 1986, so this is a very young artist, um, a whole generation younger than the other two artists that I was talking about today. It's been four years since I started Project, three main videos that make up the trilogy and the epilogue, shown here at Bangkok City Gallery. Each of the videos records a certain amount of thoughts, events, emotions, without those specific times. The work, in a way, is an engine of memory keeping and memory making. The form and materiality of this engine feels a lot like a membrane. 
I gave it a name, and it's Chantry. The denim painter started somewhere in the summer of 2011, <coughs> here in Bangkok, when I came home to spend time with my grandfather, who started to lose his ability to keep short-term memory. Now, in 2016, the project has some what finished and returned home to its starting point. I am so happy and excited to present you finally painting with history in a room filled with people with funny names. Um, and he signs it from March um, 2016 in New York. I'm just going to show a clip. Video starting 2011 to 2014. Um, it's a trilogy. I guess in, in short, it's about um, the making of this Thai denim painter as a character, and this this whole show is supposed to be an epilogue to the trilogy. You know, it's the fourth part. It's the part that kind of sums it up. I really wanted to kind of make a platform, the artwork be a platform or like a kind of a, a membrane that can like absorb like essentially everything and then kind of like output like all these ideas into, into a form. Sort of idea where I. That's it. <laughs> and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Morgan. I just want to say a couple things about myself that uh, my dear friend uh, Edward Weed didn't mention because it might be helpful in terms of, terms of understanding my point of view as I rapidly go through this narration of contemporary Chinese ink art. Uh, I'm an artist. I received an MFA and then I took a course in Islamic art and architecture at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, from uh, a new uh, Harvard guy, and uh, I loved the course. I was competing with art historians, and I aced the course, and the professor was amazed, and he said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm an artist getting an MFA, and he said, you should really look into art history. I said, no kidding, how do I do that? And he looked at me, and he said, you apply. <laughs> And I did, and miraculously, I got in, and I ended up doing the first PhD on conceptual art in the United States, which was in 1978. A number of books were published, including one with uh, Cambridge University Press. And uh, then I became interested in other things, one of which was East Asia, specifically China. And uh, so I'm going to, um, you know, Sometimes I think that I do my best talks about topics I know very little about. Uh, but uh, I seriously, I have been working uh, exuberantly and with great density of uh, analysis and thinking about uh, the art that I'm going to present. And some of this art has already been seen today. 
uh, I will make a few comments that maybe are a little different from what has already been said, hopefully. But you'll notice that I've used a Sartrean term here, historical consciousness and liberation, uh, because somehow I feel it's appropriate to the uh, extraordinary 20th century that China has endured. And I think that all art, in a sense, if it's going to be serious art, if it's really going to happen in a way that it's going to change the course of history, has to have some sense of historical consciousness. The awareness of history in the making of art is important. Now, I think that what we are experiencing now in terms of China, we've gone through the political pop, we've gone through the cynical realism, and which is a kind of, uh, I think, neo-realism, okay, on a large scale. Uh, a lot of that was very interesting to me. Uh, Zheng Fangzhu, I think, is one of the great artists of our time, uh, often overshadowed by people like uh, Ai Weiwei, who I think is also important, of course. But uh, Zheng Fangzhu, I think, uh, revealed something through his appropriation of Western uh, Western ideas in art, largely coming from Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands, and uh, took that and transformed it into something that was very Chinese. Now, uh, earlier uh, in a conversation, I was talking about how necessary it is to maintain a consciousness related to who one is, where one was born, where one grew up. Now, sometimes this form of consciousness is uh, influenced by more than one place, more than one time, uh, and a wide variety of individuals and events. Uh, but nonetheless, I think artists who really figure out a way to make art that is going to endure and have prominence in relation to a culture, and I insist that art and culture have to stay together we're under a lot of pressure now to pull them apart as a result of the advancing communications media, or I should say the, the uh, advancing information media. We mustn't mistake information for communication, okay? This is very essential. Let's get into uh, some of what I want to show you today. Long uh, Song uh, uh, is an artist that I have met in numerous places in Beijing, in New York, and in China. Uh, although we have never had a very long conversation, I pick up on an extraordinary sincerity in his work. And I was thinking just the other day about uh, Zheng Wei's work in terms of going back to the Shang Dynasty, that period, you know, maybe right before the uh, Chu Dynasty, uh, where, you know, the language wasn't really there yet. It was a kind of a primal moment. And I see his paintings as dealing with that primal moment that is kind of pre-linguistic, but still attempting to communicate an idea. And I think that that is extraordinary. Now the question that you might raise is what exactly is that idea? Well, I think there is an idea in the fact that one is alive in one's time, and that one is trying to communicate that time. And from, China, from a Chinese point of view, we must understand that there is a kind of constant revisionism or circularity, perhaps, in relation to time. Therefore, the notion of going back to this period of the Shang Dynasty is okay. Why not? Why not go toward the primal and the primary in order to come to terms with something that we are in, are in the verge of at the current moment, where in fact, with the onslaught of information, we are, get ready, losing our ability to communicate. Things are becoming somewhat primal. Let's take a look at what that primalness can be. I'm going to show you a few of these extraordinary large paintings that uh, the artist performs, to use that word, 
which it is a performance. I agree with that. It's a kind of action painting, maybe not in the sense that Harold Rosenberg met it in relation to the New York School, but I think it makes sense from a Chinese point of view. The darkness, the intrigue, the mobility, and yet the defiance of these paintings is extraordinary. Now, uh, I'm going to intersplice some of my comments with work from abstract expressionism, artists that have had some kind of impact on me and my thinking over the years. Uh, in fact, I knew Robert Motherwell for a short period of time, who was extremely encouraging, and I, I, I love Motherwell's work. We're going to look at this, which is one of his elegies, and I think what, uh, what Eric was saying earlier is extremely important to keep in mind that many of these artists who are doing work that looks Asian, in fact, don't have that consciously in mind, okay? Which is why it should be trusted from my point of view. In other words, if it was a so-called intention, which American art schools love to talk about as justifying bad work, Okay, then uh, let's take a look at something that is not so intentional that just happens. And I'm very taken by these paintings. I was when I first saw them in 1965 at the Museum of Modern Art at a wonderful uh, exhibition curated by Frank O'Hara. Frank O'Hara was a poet. You know, honestly, I think that MoMA needs a new poet as a curator, which it does not have. Okay. Uh, this is another of his paintings, uh, very typical of a certain period that uh, Mother Will was very much a part of. Uh, he was very familiar with the situation in Spain after Franco, and he felt that it was a kind of death to Romanticism. That's a very important point. Uh, what does that mean, death to Romanticism? I think it means that information is taking over communication. Uh, Chu Bing is another artist that I have uh, talked with on numerous occasions, whose work I think is one of the most important of the 21st century. His Book from the Sky is a, an extraordinary work of art. It's an installation. Uh, it's uh, a kind of, not necessarily a rebuke of language, but a transformation of the, of the history of language, certainly from a Chinese point of view, because all these ideographs, of course, are made up, more than 4,000 of them, are entirely uh, different from one another. I often think of this in relation to Bruce Nauman's work, Wall Floor Positions from 1969, where for an hour, every 10 seconds, Nauman is changing his position between the wall and the floor, never copying the same position twice. And he has to remember what he already did so that he doesn't repeat it again. And I think in the case of Xu Bing, he has to remember the characters that he has created, that he has virtually made up, okay, that are not Chinese characters. They are of his own imagination. But he has to remember his imagination. He has to be alert to what that imagination is doing. And I think that's art, okay? He is aware of his imagination in the process of doing it. He transformed the appearance of the ideogram from China into English. Art for the people, which is a political slogan. Well, we have to remember that uh, certainly politics have played an important role, to put it mildly, in terms of China throughout the 20th century into the 21st century. So why not have an English look at these Chinese ideograms to try and understand what that means? Some of this work is incredibly poetic. I would say trying to keep the romance of art alive, which is very positive. And we see the ideograms flying off of their base, transforming into these magnificent doves, flying through the air 
and the uh, let's see, I, I remember seeing a work very similar to this in one of the Shanghai biannuals, and uh, giving language a new kind of lyricism that has its concreteness as well as its fluidity. An amazing body of work that he has given us. Uh, I so much believed in this work that he created of the phoenix, made of the raw materials of throwaway detritus that he found in China, and uh, transformed into these great mythic birds. And this is in the St. John the Divines in New York, up on 110th Street, and here is an overview looking down at this extraordinary creature that flies, that symbolizes, if you will, a kind of liberation, or at least confronts us with the need to find that liberation. I think it is a misnomer to talk about political art. I just saw something online that said this morning, political art is the best art. I think it's not. I think it's the most misunderstood art. I love the statement of Herbert Marcuse in his book, The Aesthetic Dimension, where he says, this was published in the late 70s, where he said, all serious art is political because all serious art, the artist strives for liberation within the context of oppression. And politics is oppression that we live with. Therefore, the act of art is the act of individual liberation. The phoenix of Xu Bing. Gu Wenda, who was spoken of earlier, here he is with his hair that he has derived from multiple places throughout the globe. Hair from all races, all peoples, whether it's in the northern or southern hemisphere. I saw his first hair piece in 1993 in uh, Wuch, Poland. I was there for an event, 126 international artists, and Wenda was present. We had met previous to that through a very charming and important art historian, Peter Seltz, who I've known for many, many years, and uh, Peter suggested that we meet when Wenda came from San Francisco with his wife at the time to New York, and so we met. And uh, I watched this progress with the hair and the ideographs, how he was going to uh, do something that was extraordinary in relation to body, in relation to mind, in relation to design, how he was going to show, again, a transitional made-up alphabet, not exactly what we see in Xu Bing. Often they have been compared, and it's true that they were both working in New York at the same time. But it's a different idea that is not just of freedom of mind, but freedom of body and freedom of spirit. One of the great aspects of Chinese art that I have learned to recognize is its tripartite, as opposed to the duality of the West form and content. In China, form, content, spirit, you never got the chop on the scroll unless spirit, the qi, the qi was present. Okay, here is some of the work that he was doing. Some of this in installation context is extraordinary. It's uh, it's, it's got this sensorial uh, context, I think, particularly when you see the panels together. It creates a kind of uh, paneled structure, a domicile of some sort. As we see here, this was shown at the San Francisco MoMA, but it was also present 
at the Brooklyn Museum in New York. Okay, uh, uh, Ching Fong. Uh, I, I first met him in, uh, I, I believe, the United States. Maybe it was in Beijing, I'm not sure. But uh, out of the blue, a year ago, uh, he asked if I would write something for his catalog uh, because he would be showing a piece in the refectory uh, of this church in uh, Venice. It was between the biannual years and he was very interested in having an audience that would come and see this uh, extraordinary work. Now, uh, one can talk about this perhaps as something very basic, maybe influenced by certain aspects of Zen, uh, certainly I think uh, aspects of Japanese calligraphy have come into the work, which he obviously knew, but uh, there is this, uh, this energy, this tune, uh, this release, release of energy that is very important to him and very important to his aesthetic. Uh, I have to say that from 1966 to 67, I was studying with a Japanese calligrapher by the name of Kongo Abe from the Nakikai Association in Osaka. And uh, that was in Cambridge. And I was with him for a year and a half, and then his health got bad, and it was very difficult for him to continue. But uh, I began to understand the kind of energy, the kind of characterless uh, ideograph. Okay? Now, we also see that in the work of uh, uh, Wang Dongling. Okay? Uh, Wang Dongling has gotten into some trouble, I understand, from the government for doing this characterless work. Uh, uh, Jiyun has been able to uh, continue it, uh, maybe because he's not coming from the point of view of calligraphy so much, but from the point of view of tradition in painting. Here are some extraordinary pieces from his desire to see some of these work like this was shown in Venice in 2016. Now I'm going to show you Jackson Pollock. We've already seen a work by Pollock and this is number 32, one of the great Pollocks at the uh, Kunstsammlung in Dusseldorf, which is where it is at this moment. Uh, one of the great Pollocks, I think. It's great in the sense that it really shows what he is doing, what he is thinking, what he is feeling, but the uh, extraordinary balance of the surface, where no area takes control of another area. Uh, now, to clarify, uh, there's no way that either Motherwell or Pollock uh, was thinking that they were going to somehow copy Chinese art or copy Japanese art. It was something within themselves that made it happen. It was not an intention. It was, get ready, a feeling. Okay, uh, Zheng Chongbin. I was hoping he would be here today, but he is uh, in uh, Shanghai. And uh, he sent me a wonderful note. I think he's a great artist and calligrapher. I just saw some of his work in New York on uh, 83rd in Madison. Here are his diagonal blocks. He's very, very interested in the diagonal. And I don't know of any other Chinese artist who works with the diagonal uh, consecutively the way uh, Chong Bin does. The way uh, Zheng Chong Bin, I think over the years, because he's lived in San Rafael, which is not too far from here, of course, uh, for nearly 30 years, uh, he maintains contact frequently going to Shanghai and Beijing, Shenzhen, and other places. But the point is that the diagonal, to me, is a constructivist indicator that he has picked up as a kind of Western sign and integrated it into his lexicon, into his Chinese vocabulary. Here we see it again. There has been work in your gallery, Edward, uh, not so differently from what we're seeing right here where the diagonal, which is the dynamicism, as Naholi Naj talked about in terms of his idea of constructivism in the late 20s. But this is Chinese, again. 
and it is the tradition and the culture from which he comes. And to be in his studio, or to be in an exhibition where these panels of work are seen in relation to one another, is an extraordinary experience. Okay, uh, Lin Yan, uh, somebody that I was introduced to many years ago by uh, Shen Chen, who is in the audience and whose exhibition, whose wonderful exhibition, is downstairs. I'm so happy it's there. Congratulations, Edward, for that uh, extraordinary show. Uh, I think that Lin Yan uh, has always tried to bring in uh, symbolic signs in relation to her very sparse, sometimes minimal based work. Minimal not in the sense of minimal art, but in the sense of reductive. Let's use that word, maybe a better one. Uh, she's constantly dealing with um, paper as something that one can cast in relation to metal objects that have significance for her, as we see here. Uh, often she will uh, fold and crease the uh, uh, Xuan paper and sometimes uh, saturate it with ink over and over again. Uh, here's a piece that I saw in Beijing maybe about five years ago after I had done a lecture at the uh, Peking University. And uh, she was interested in what's happening to the skies in Beijing. And she remembers when she was young, when she was a small girl with the blue skies riding her bicycle down the street. She remembers this so clearly. And now, what is happening to the skies of, I don't think it's funny, to the skies of Berlin, of Beijing. I mean, it's, it's incredible uh, what is going on. And I'm not sure that the government is really doing what it needs to do forcefully enough, without corruption, to change the situation in Beijing. Here's a close-up of this marvelous work. It was also shown in New York, by the way, at the Tenry Gallery. And then she will show the opposite. Uh, I saw this work in Belgium, in Brussels. I'm trying to remember the year, I think about four or five years ago. An extraordinary work. And here is her cheetah, which truly becomes a symbol of the kind of chi, the kind of energy she is struggling to make apparent in her life and in her career. Embracing stillness. I love this idea because it is Wu Wei. Wu Wei is the, uh, the action based on stillness, or the stillness based on action. Ah, here we have Shen Chen. Uh, Shen Chen, are you still in the audience or have you left? Because, you know, often Shen Chen, he gets so embarrassed by my lectures that he'll get up and leave. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how. I got you to stay this time. How did it happen? Uh, okay. Sorry, Shen Chen. Uh, listen, I have been in touch with this artist for uh, nearly 20 years, and I have watched his development in terms of how he deals with acrylic as ink. Now his point is, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but he is interested in the materiality of ink and also in how ink functions in relation to the paper or in relation to the canvas. So it is a kind of transcription, as it were, physically, materially, in terms of how you take the concept of ink, how you take that and make it look like the energy is simply carefully exuding from the surface. Now he's going back and forth with these brushes that are flat and wide, and he will pull them from one end to the other. Now keep in mind, we're seeing the work vertically on the wall downstairs. But if you go to the studio of Shenzhen, the work is done on the floor. Now we just saw a photograph of Pollock as he was working on the canvas on the floor. But this is not the way Shen Shen works, okay? He has another idea. He has another modus operandi, so to speak, where he is pulling the paint and then pulling it back. But he does it in two parts, so it's, it's flat on the surface. So 
when it goes up on the wall vertically, it's something different than how he works it and makes it happen. You know, I maintain this, that uh, often we talk about concrete art in the West as having some kind of analytic quality, of detachment, okay? And we talk of the gesture in expressionism in the West as something that has a kind of romant, rom romantic aura, okay? Or a kind of tactility that we relate to poetically, visually, okay? In the case of these paintings, they are analytical when they're on the floor and very focused and very concentrated. Shen Chen is one of the most precise artists that I know in terms of the kind of work that he's doing. But when it goes up on the wall, it <coughs> is pure romance. Therefore, it has led me to believe that there is no difference between precision and intuition. Now, one time, Vladimir Nabokov was asked in an interview by Maurice Girodias. Maurice said, Vladimir, what is art? And he says, art is precision. This is in 1955 in Paris. And then he says, well, if art is precision, what is science? Science is intuition. And then Maurice said, excuse me, Vladimir, didn't you get them confused? He says, I said art is precision. Science is intuition. I think that's something to think about. Maybe what is missing in art today is this kind of precision that one can understand in a way that is contributing to the quality and the sensorial dimension of our lives. Maybe. Anyway. Is how I understand this work. Uh, this is very close to the one, to one of the works that is downstairs. And uh, I love these new works with the white because I think that they really show the process as well as exude the feeling, as we see in this painting. And in this extraordinary triptych, there's another one. Is it the same one? No, it's different. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, anyway, the point is that you've got some really great triptychs, and this is one. Okay, uh, I'll move this along. Uh, uh, Yang Ji Chan, am I supposed to, what does it say? Three minutes? There's no problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the ink art show that was done at the Met had a number of very, very interesting artists, and I think it got a bad rap from the New York Times. Anytime there's a good show in New York, leave it to the New York Times to denounce it. Uh, they need better writers, honestly. Okay, uh, but uh, I think this is great work. This goes back uh, to a very early piece from 1990, in which the layers of ink are one on top of the, the other. Sometimes more than 100 layers of ink. And what happens over this period of time, okay, is that the the surface begins to shine. It begins to glimmer. So we're seeing light that is coming off the surface of the black. The blackness, okay, is showing the light. I was blown away by this group of work. Here's Ed Reinhardt, who painted presumably black paintings, but all those colors are mixed. This is from his series, uh, The Last Painting, as they were called. Uh, Ad Reinhardt, a very important artist for us, probably closest to an Eastern context in terms of that abstract expressionist period, because he, he actually traveled to Asia, uh, which none of the other artists did, okay? Uh, but he was, a, he was a little younger, it came a little bit later. But he said, the end of art is art as art. The end of art is not the end. Art in art is art. I can't finish this lecture without talking about Wong Dong Ling, one of the great 
artist calligraphers in China today. Uh, Chuanzu. This is a floor painting now hanging in his own style. This is characterless calligraphy. As is this. This is Franz Kahn. Here is a painting of his, and here's another one. Now, it was assumed that Kahn, back in the 50s, was looking at Japanese calligraphy. China wasn't in the picture at that time for Kahn. Neither was Japan for that matter. He was putting it together from his own mind and spirit. This is Wang Dongli. This is Wang Dongli. This is from 2014, three years ago. Look at this. Look at this. It's extraordinary. You know, we used to have this expression in the art world that something is in the air. In other words, we catch something at a different place at a different time. Of course, now we have, you know, the, the smartphones. And people say, oh, it's the same thing today. You know something? It's not the same thing today. It's not. That when something is in the air, you feel it. When something is on the phone, you discard it. Here's a photograph I took of uh, his painting of the Dati Ching at the Met in 2014. This is, uh, this is as great as any Pollock hanging on the wall, like number 32. And here he is doing one of his great uh, signs, characterless ideograms. And he was once asked, why do you do these? And he said, because there are tall buildings in class. We need big paintings to accompany this architecture. But because he is the premier calligrapher in China, he's getting a lot of difficulty from the government. Now, uh, they want the old signs to have meaning. But you know something? For new meaning to come out of Chinese art, sometimes you have to obliterate the old to make it happen, to make it shine. I think that Wong Dongli, among many of these other artists, is searching for the light. Thank you. Challenges. I I grow from I uh, uh, say in China, so my English is really poor. So today is a really big challenge for to me. Uh, so if I make some mistake, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I started the, my uh, recent project called the Keyword Lab, Social Botany. Uh, I started the keywords project in 2005. Uh, before 2005, I would like to. Uh, I, I I was the member of the Big Tail Elephant. That's a how is it? Um, arti uh, artists group in Guangzhou. Yeah. in New York. So, uh, 
uh, in this piece, there are four channels of a video and uh, four uh, channels of the projection, the slides projection. Uh, and all this uh, from, how do you say, you can see a lot of the toils and uh, some foods. That's, uh, how do you say, I bought. Oh, I should explain. explain. This one was built, uh, was made in um, Bern. Sometimes uh, Switzerland, Ben. Yeah. So at that time we went to many uh, Asian uh, supermarkets to buy all these things. So, so this kind of the made in China, but buy buy in the bought in West. So, so the um, title is made in China in nineties. Okay. Um, um, so I come back to my topic now. In 2011, the keyword project began to code the keyword lab. Before it was called the searching for keywords and the keyword school. In the past years, I made many, how to say, conversation, investigations, and interviews in many different different places. Uh, also in the world, but mostly I put my main attention on the Pearl, Pearl River Delta area. So uh, I show some image of the uh, early keywords projects. This 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 Im image is about searching searching for keywords. Uh, I interview a lot of people, then I make the dictionary called the keywords dictionary. And after that, since uh, 2008, I began the keyword school project. This, uh, this image was the school was organized by <laughs> David Su in the Yeah, you can see this one. Yeah. Um, and and this, this piece is uh, the uh, keyword school in Venice in 2009. Okay, um, uh, I, I have talked to more than hundreds of people in PRD area, including farmers, nursery staff, governmental garden officials, urban construction department officials, people from the lo uh, relocated households, People who have planted gardens on their own and the artistic worker working with the plants attract. After the <coughs> uh, how to say the investigation and the research, I examined the or I, I start to do the uh, research. I exam examined the the recorded materials using the language analysis, selecting the keywords. Um, and creating the keywords <clears throat> uh, using the visual media to make the composition. I, I how do you say, uh, regard my work as composition. Uh, the project uh, showed me three direction. Uh, um, so the the first direction uh, was the farming or agricultural planting and workers. Second, urban and rural construction and green cultivation. Third, citizen and residents self-initiated planting movement. So today I would like to uh, uh, come back to the, my topic. Since the start of the keyword lab, social botany, uh, I have had a lot of, a lot of the very good experience with different people in different places, spaces, especially in so-called natural places like the mountain earth and the river area. Well, the people taught me from their knowledge of vegetation, planting, and a natural cycle 
we also were really enjoy enjoy the talking together. Huh? Yeah. Um, I think the, my interviews were not like formal interview in, uh, in investigations. Um, more like the exchanging experience with the interviewee. Huh? Um, so this is different from the social uh, investigation. Huh? Yeah. With open heart and minds. Yeah, this is it. This is a, uh, I interviewed some farmer in the forest. The forest is the, how do you say, uh, yeah. So after the first uh, investigation, I review that uh, I will review the video file, the video file from our talk, uh, from our talk outside. Uh, so it comes the next uh, research pro uh, period. Uh, in, in the in this period, I will use the my my so-called methodology. It's a low methodology to to do the research from a visual and a spoken material to select the key points, so-called key points, including keywords and the key sites, with key sense. And then uh, mix it with the thinking, reading, I come to the new pro, uh, period, creating keyword, uh, keywords, which is conclusion of the research. I regard, uh, I regard this as knowledge production. I think this period is, is not just the process of the produce visual knowledge. I think visual knowledge is different. Uh, I think, um, how to say, I always say that's a kind of the conceptual creation. Sometimes I call it, uh, I call it, I take take part in the conceptual game in the role of the visual artist. I went to several villages in different county, counties in PRD. PRD means the River Delta area. Huh? Yeah. And I uh, interviewed uh, some farmers. Um, yeah, we talk a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, after talking and after uh, the research, I decided to make the composition using the multimedia. I used the four ways to do the composition. The first, performance. Uh, so, because I regard that talking to the people is kind of, is sort of the performance, not just the, um, how to say, I, I, I said before, yeah. Two, video installation. Uh, I will use the video file to, to do the video installation. Writing. Uh, writing is very important for me. I have a, a special writing way called uh, visible speech writing. That means if I want to write something, I did not take the pen and the paper. I just uh, turn on the camera, uh, the video camera towards to me. I speak to the camera. I think this, I call it a visible speech writing and the text. The four, uh, the four workshop. Uh, because I think Keyword Lab is a kind of the public lab. So the workshop component become a very important thing of the social activity. Uh, mixed uh, with uh, performance art, re uh, research, and knowledge production. So encourage common people thinking about the research uh, come together. Yeah. <clears throat> I call all these method uh, next method to use for composition. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I will uh, tell. Um, I mean, after this, uh, I mean, I will introduce, uh, explain two uh, three com compositions. Uh, after research had com composed, I will find, I will select some some keywords, 
here, the first project uh, I, I found some keywords. It was endurance and animalistic freedom. Uh, the second was a group of the keywords plant, seeds, semen, and uh, consanguinity. Um, uh, now I would like to talk, um, talk about the third project called the land and the turf. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, the first conversation uh, with the Obviously, some words is created created by me. Uh, animalistic freedom. That's in Chinese. I don't know if this is, it is very good translated or not. Uh, um, for the time, I, I don't want to talk more about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the second second group of keywords. This is um, this word is by Aristotle. Eudaimonia, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, also from the video um, image. Yeah. Um, so I, I would like to talk about the third, but uh, the keyword is land and the turf. Um, for uh, I think I would like to, because the land and turf is, uh, will participate in uh, a project in the uh, Queen's Museum in New York. So I have to make a three minutes uh, statement. So can I come down? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think if, if I show the, the statement, maybe it's more easy to. It's, yeah. <coughs>
<coughs> okay, uh, this is not artwork. Uh, this is just a statement. Uh, statement. So uh, uh, the Tanka people um, since Song Dynasty is living on the periphery of the periphery. So people say in the Qing Dynasty, you can every day you can see hundreds of thousands of the small boats on the river. But uh, how do you say, um, uh, in the, how do you say, I said in 1949, 19, uh, uh, so they are invited to go, uh, to living on land. But after, re, how do you say, after opening reform, re, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, later, early 80s, so because they have no, originally they have no land, so they, they have to go back to the to the river. So now this group of people almost uh, how to say I think we can just find one or two old aging the people there. The group will disappear soon, I think. Um, okay. I will, I will show they how to say So they have no land, so they make some island, island or river to plant many things. So because they, they think the land is so treasured, so important, but they have not. Yeah. So we can see the, the big round building just in, in the same area. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, video installation, just uh, one of the four channels. Uh, uh, now, uh, I, uh, I talk the next. So besides the, how do you say, uh, working in the River Delta area, I also um, do projects outside. Um, I, I, I would like to, how do you say, tell a little bit about the social botany in San Francisco. Uh, so I like to work in the Cantonese area because I can speak in Cantonese. Uh, so during the how to say last uh, last two years investigation, I got to know that the immigrant immigration of the plants is very extensive phenomenon uh, in all the parts of the world. 
uh, just like the human immigra immigration, it's a global phenomenon. So I use the term immigration, immigrant lens as a metaphor in order to research in the Chinese community, Chinese community in Bay Area. Uh, so after one and a half years investigation in in 2016-4, I started the keywords public lab in San Francisco in China, Chinatown, the uh, Rose Alley 40s. Uh, I invited three American Chinese social activists who are also making art. Sometimes they use the art as the media to do the social practice. I have been following them, interviewing and uh, studying, <coughs> studying their work. So then I make a dialogue exhibition um, and a workshop with one after another. Uh, that means uh, I spend th three months to, to make a three dialogue exhibition with them. Uh, I think it would be very important to research how social practice arts are carried out. What's the new possibility of these artists working in the Chinese community or in society? For example, I hear our say, For example, uh, Mr. Roy Chen is a is a community planner. Uh, he he made some social projects with the artistic media. Uh, he he made a very famous uh, project. In, like the Madison Square Park in Auckland. Uh, this was the protection project using the performance and the video and creating the actions in order to change the cities, change the city's plan. The, the city's plan uh, was taken down the park and then Roy Chen success, success to get it. Get it. Um, now I um, so for uh, for my holiday this this project I just realized sometime uh, and the topic of the political correct, but sometime with some people's personal reason very strong personal reason. So uh, Roy's parents ha have a yard in, in 2007. After his father passed away, he spent, he spent several years gardening in, in, the, in the yard to commemorate his father. Gardening helped him to pull through from two years of the very bad spiritual situation. The reason is the father's passed away. Huh? Uh, now, uh, now because because he is very busy working and uh, also he has two children, so he had to give up just gardening. Huh? So, so I know when I know that, I suggested to to him that can we go back to the your father's yard like, together and then. Uh, then something again, yeah. So we we talk, and then, and then, so I mean while talking we we plan. Uh, he said that when when he sees his father's yard and plants with vegetable again, it led it it led him to think of many things. He told me that he just did the gardening to commemorate his father. He realized the cycle of the life and energy. He 
felt he felt that his father's life was transferred into the plant. Let me see. When you see the plant growing up, you say, my father's life just did. Yeah. Um, uh, and then when his son was born, he realized that this is kind of the line, it's a bloodline. Uh, So maybe let's show the video. It's more. Yeah. That's it. Father's yard. You know, the, or did the echo learning, the, the first two years, mm -hmm. I think uh, the emotions are the strongest. Uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, it changes every day. So mm -hmm. yeah. So I think, uh, mm -hmm. right, so going back to what I said before, so I think uh, the, the land is a way to uh, show us the, the cycle of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody passes, we, we put them on the earth, but then we also bring life back from the earth through planting, we understand when we talk about roots, changgan, mm. it's also about mm. reconnecting with the mm. life before us mm. and that we're part of a, a cycle, a part of a, a, a line. Mm. So, uh, so the land is very, has a lot of meaning, it's very emotional, mm. there's a deep connection. So through the land, I feel like I can reconnect or connect with uh, my father, my grandfather, and people who came before me. So, and it's just through working with the the land and the earth. You know, when I was planting the garden and working at Madison Park and uh, I think I was just drawn to that work uh, at the moment but I didn't understand why mm -hmm. so but it's only after several years working with the Madison Park community working with the the, uh, the garden here every day after a couple of years, think, looking back, I realized mm -hmm. that it was this ongoing conversation that I was having with uh, with my father. It was a very spiritual place, the, the yard, Madison Park, and there's so much. Uh, I think people at the park they always talk about how you know. I think you asked earlier. Why this park? Why not other parks? And um, a lot of people that go to the park, some of the seafoods there, they say they feel uh, part of this. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. So even he's not here, the energy, he's still part of that energy. So okay. you, you really feel that? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Uh, my baby there mm. a couple of years ago no. uh, oh so after I had to leave the park because I had to, we had to 
give birth to my first son. And so mm -hmm. after a year, I came back to the park and mm -hmm. I brought my son back to the park and introduced him to everybody. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, touching uh, moment because I felt like I was bringing my son to meet my father. Oh. So, uh, through, by, by introducing him to his friends, to my friend, to that community, to being, and just being at the park. There's a very spiritual moment. Okay. You really yeah. feel that? Yeah, I felt it that day, yeah. So, also some keywords come from the project. The energy and the uh, ren qi, this is a Japanese and Chinese word, means the human energy and also different revolution. Uh, I mean, it's the, so because of time, I, <laughs> I have to finish now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.